hello, thank you for clicking the little play button to see my third year presentation. My name is Amanda Maris and I'm here to present the mixed age Waldorf cohort. What the heck is that? That sounds so oxymoronic to me. And in fact, when I was in Waldorf teacher training, the only times I heard about mixing ages was actually with combined grades rather than a multiple of ages. Uh, unless we're talking about kindergarten with multiple ages in the kindergarten. Most of the time when I hear about these kind of classrooms, I hear them from unfortuitous circumstances. Such was the case for me. When I started teaching your training in 2017, I was really exploring the schools around me in which I wanted to work. I didn't know if I wanted to get a public teaching credential because that's more school and go to the, the uh, charter schools, but this, the one private school in the area felt so lovely. I loved it so much. It just didn't feel like mine. So I really had that question of what I'm going to be doing with my education when I leave. And then in September of 2019, a couple of vaccine laws passed in which I saw all the doors in front of me just slam shut. But fortunately, I saw it as a, actually the silver lining, the, the calling of my education, where I'm meant to be. I'm actually meant to take this education and bring it to the homeschool setting for all kinds of families who, like me, wanted their children in a particular school and don't see that opportunity anymore. So I've got a really interesting mix of, of students and families, some of them who have had Waldorf uh, education in the, with the preschool or kindergarten, and some who just knew that public school wasn't for them. But before I talk about them a little bit further, I really want to explore that oxymoron. I mean, why? Do we not see mixed age Waldorf schools in the grades? Well, we know that the first Steiner school was divided very specifically into calendar age, developmentally, um, that the, the gestures of the four bodies birthing and incarnating take roughly seven year cycles, and that we can observe through their artistic expression, through the physiological development, where they are, where children are developmentally, and offer them material that is enlivening. We know that if we offer them such material that speaks to their soul development, that we're bringing them forces that enliven them for life. And that if we bring them information that is too intellectual, especially too young of an age, we are giving them deadening forces that also have a lasting impact. And that kind of knowledge as a teacher is so daunting and uh, frightening and it could be outright paralyzing if um, we don't have a solid understanding of what we're doing. Um, but, whew, I mean, I really think that that kind of heavy task as a teacher is the single reason why these kinds of um, classrooms are just not encouraged. So my class, hmm, I've got six-year-olds, I've got four six-year-olds, and they're all rough and tumble and very choleric and thick-skinned and thin-skinned, and I've got a delicate little five-year-old who's just coming into the being and her body and just starting to explore her, her, her physicality, and her big brother who is nearly eight and will be in the second grade. So before I had this class, I started thinking about what we all share, what kind of things we all have in common when we're in Waldorf schools. And I got really excited to think about food, how much we all prepare and eat and bless our food together. So I started thinking about what kinds of ways I can bring in the main lesson into a weekly, if not bi-weekly cooking class coming together when um, we all take part in the physical labor of the, of the cooking process, of 
course, my little ones would focus more on, on their skills, on, on even chopping and, and making sure that they don't cut each other <laughs> and um, practicing those, those physical skills. I really look forward to taking the third grade history, the fifth grade history, foods from around the world and incorporating them into our recipes. Um, bringing in unleavened bread when we are discussing Moses and bringing in um, ancient wise ways of uh, fermenting and storing foods when we discuss um, all the ancient peoples from around the world. And this most recently I'm going to have a lot of fairy tales I offer. So I want to bring out the, the good witch, the shaman, the medicine man, and offer healing herbal potions, magical healing potions to my students this way. When they get into middle school and I've got this sort of straddling sixth grade, fourth grade, we can take it from a more mathematical approach, compiling our recipes, augmenting them for large feasts, or reducing recipes with our fractions down to you know, the single family of four. And as they're all in middle school, well, the majority of my students will be in middle school. We'll be cooking together so much that we'll be budgeting um, and we'll be, they'll actively take part in pulling apart recipes that they hear about or um, are curious about from the people in their stories. And we'll, we'll plan our menu together, we'll budget it out, and then in eighth grade, when we have eighth graders, we'll be able to round out our menu according to a health perspective. So food is just going to be a window to everybody's heart and everybody's stomach um, and, and a way of, of bringing us all together even when we have different things we want to learn about. I also want to look at the, the, the traditional block rotation period that um, <laughs> the pressure and, and the the anxiety about knowing, not knowing which you know st stories to leave out, and when we teach a block, we really want to. We have to leave out so much, and one thing that's exciting, at least for the younger students to come in, is that they'll have a picture of what their older students have been learning about, almost by osmosis, by just doing it. Uh, without knowing the intellectual reasons behind it. And by the time that my, say, five-year-old is in third or fourth grade, she's going to have younger siblings coming up with her, going through that same process. And um, she'll be able to have, she'll have to learn different lessons so that they're all new, so that she doesn't feel like she's, she's uh, getting something, especially my now sixth grader is going to, you know, want to have um, something new every year too. So I think about something like our natural environment and how that is another big overarching something we all share and bring together. Um, if I'm looking at, for instance, this chalkboard drawing, my kindergartners don't necessarily need to know that this is an aerial map of a place they've visited frequently and probably have very fond memories of, of visiting. They don't need to know that we will be attending regular field trips, hiking, moving through the space, feeling the water, playing in the water that they see. But if we look at a chalkboard drawing and we take uh, our paintbrush and we want to paint this, for instance, they could just focus on the beautiful ribbon of blue and follow it with their paintbrushes or their hands or their feet or their whole bodies on a big space that's sandy that we can really see the treading of their feet moving in. And um, I can draw it multiple ways. I can leave out the, the, the browns and the greens and just focus on the blue ribbon. And layer upon layer, bring in more elements over the course of a, of a week or a few weeks, depending on how in-depth we go, so that the older students start to see, aha, aha, mountains, oh, hills, oh, sand, oh, probably those are waves, and get the, get the hint while the younger ones are just going to enjoy more exciting things that are added to a chalkboard drawing. 
Now, some of the overarching, you know, exciting things that bring us all together, such as our natural world, are actually ways to find some of the um, more original, more of the original impulses behind Star Steiner's education. A colleague of mine is about to open his own school on over 300 acres of preservation and tribal land, and he's going to be as out, almost 100% outdoors with his school. He's also seeking purposefully a mixed age cohort because he understands the same things that I understand when it comes to social education. We see a family nucleus of children with multiple ages and we know that um, in a family you have to stick together. You can't escape the problems between siblings and parents and elders and you have to, you have to um, work through them. And we know that Steiner also really wanted his classrooms to be a microcosm of, of the greater community in which they live. And we know that our growing diverse communities not only have a differing of opinions or um, of intelligence or of will forces, I mean intelligence, what is that? <laughs> but, you know, we have to look at now a diversity of backgrounds and family dynamics and why not bring in this natural formation of the family with multiple ages working together too, to solve the same, same issues, to look at the same problems and come at them from their experience. So I really feel like um, the social components that Waldorf education has is only enhanced when you have a mixed age. It's like looking at a Japanese garden or an English botanical garden, for instance. You know that the teacher, the gardener, came in and manipulated the space like crazy, right? Like pruning and, and weeding and choosing the layout. But here it is, enhanced in its most idyllic form. It, it's, it's made to look like it's been unmolested by human hands. And the classroom is kind of like that dynamic in which I'm the gardener looking at the individual plants in front of me and wondering how can they harmoniously work together? How can they support each other with their nutrients and uh, their skills and lift, lift each other up to become one beautiful community that is actually a representative of the beautiful world in which we live? And it's really kind of the only the synthetic garden in which you see one age, one species, all growing up together. There's benefits to it. I've actually visited Lassen recently and saw some of these beautiful pine trees growing up. But um, I just don't see it being, I see it being a an unnatural phenomenon. Now, when I look at the world around me, I also know that we live in the craziest times. And I'm thinking of this tap root. If I'm going to take my classroom and pull it into a, 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 a plant that can weather the drought of whatever it is we're going through right now, I'm looking down deep and trying to pull up the true original impulses down to the bedrock of this plant and bringing it out of my classroom. What did Steiner really want? He wanted a social change. He wanted a um, he wanted this to be healing education above all. He wanted to embody the spiritual soul development of, of our families. And I really think that the multiple age classroom is not antithetical to the single grade classroom, but in fact, it allows us to strip away a lot of the dogma that's come out that has laid to rest in many schools throughout the past 100 years. So I, for one, look forward to bringing that taproot down, bringing out those original impulses, and bringing them to communities in my homeschool multiple age classroom in the fall. Thank you.